So our guest tonight is Martha Campbell, who is a principal at the Rocky Mountain Institute. She's been with RMI for about seven years and is over the, uh, in the Bay Area in Oakland. She's the co-founder of RMI's Realize Initiative and will be talking to us today about that initiative that's part of the building, building's practice. She has been in green construction for much of her life, including as an intern for a very famous eco-architect, Mike Reynolds. She's worked also on the organizing side and the financial side. So she brings a very, very diverse background. She's originally from El Paso, um, went to University of Michigan for an MBA and MS and is uh, back in the Bay Area because she knows that this is the place in the world to be. So with Nothing more to say. I'm going to hand it over to you, Martha. Welcome, and thank you so much for meeting with us this evening. Okay, let me take you off mute. There you go. And thank you for having me. Um, and it's great to see everyone's faces. This is a, a new experience for me to be on a Zoom with so many people. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar um, with RMI, I'll just, I'll give you a kind of a brief um, summary of, of what we do. Um, RMI has existed for almost 40 years. Uh, it was co-founded by Amory and Hunter Lovins uh, in the Roaring Fork Valley of Colorado, hence the reason for the word Rocky Mountain, our words Rocky Mountain in the name. Um, and it is a Think and Do Tank focused on transitioning our economy off fossil fuels using market-based approaches. And we um, focus on kind of the four main end uses of energy. So buildings, transportation, the power sector and industrials. Um, and we do work um, globally. Um, so we started out being US-based, but we have expanded our focus and our reach. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about Realized, which is an initiative within our buildings program. Um, and realizes focus on uh, rapidly scaling um, net zero carbon retrofits across the US. Um, our kind of like back of the envelope high level math is that in the US alone, um, we need to be retrofitting about three and a half million buildings per year to net zero to meet our climate goals. Um, and we're obviously nowhere near that. So, um, First, I'll, 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 tell, I'll kind of define the problem um, from our perspective, and then we'll talk about a really exciting um, solution that's emerged in, in Europe. And then we'll talk through some, some of the technologies associated with that solution, as well as some of the business models and the financing structures um, that have helped enable this approach. And then we'll talk about a few pilots we have in the pipeline, and then kind of um, how we're continuing to move this concept forward um, in the market. So first, the problem. So I like to show this diagram just to kind of give the sense of, of a kind of a corollary of what we're asking people to do. If when you wanted to buy a cell phone, you had gone into a Verizon store and they had asked you to select the towers that you want to route your network um, uh, service through, the frequency of the signal, um, all of the uh, components that would go into your cell phone, um, and to also bring the financing, now that we're talking about smartphones, the financing for your, for your $1,000 smartphone uh, with you into the store when you wanted to make this purchase, the rate of adoption that we would have seen for cell phones would have been much lower. And this is basically what we're asking people to do in the energy efficiency sector. Um, there's just so much that the customer still has to figure out or pay somebody to figure out for them um, that it's, it's just creating points for attrition in every single step of that process. And so one of the things that we think needs to happen um, is this needs to become more of a service model offering. So I'm going to try and play this. If it doesn't work, um, we'll just skip it. But Folks may have already seen this video. It's a video um, from uh, 
an organization called Energy Sprong in the Netherlands. Um, and it is of a retrofit that was conducted in a day. Um, I'm actually gonna try and turn the music down. So these are unitized wall panels, which means they have pre-installed window, high performance windows and doors, and they are achieving passive house levels of performance. And they are basically hanging these wall panels onto the facade of an existing structure. And you, you might have noticed what looked like a surveyor at the beginning. He was actually doing a 3D scan of the building and that's how they know exactly where to attach those panels. And they also do a 3D scan of um, the panels before they cut the fenestrations to pre-install those windows and doors. So that big white thing was the mechanical box. It's got domestic hot water, um, heating and cooling, ventilation, a PV inverter and controls, and that all attaches and, and is accessible from the exterior of the building. There that mechanical box is again. So the windows are pre-installed and then all they have to do is just kind of come in and trim out the, the interior of the windows. They also have um, high performance prefab roofing systems that they come and set on top of the, the existing roof. They had terracotta tiles on this before. They remove those for weight reasons. Your solar racking is pre-installed. And then they basically will um, put the panels in later. Some, some systems now already even have the um, PV uh, pre-installed on, on the roof. And it might be for insurance purposes that they weren't previously. So you can kind of see the, you know, where those major seams are. They use um, different gasketing systems to uh, to make sure they're airtight and get the, keep those passive house levels of performance. Little prefab shed. And most of these projects um, will also undergo like a full um, bathroom and kitchen remodel. So it's part of a major um, capital improvement to the building. Um, so that you're only having to really cover the incremental costs of, of doing this kind of uh, major overhaul to the building. So there's the, the finished product. And again, um, that install was conducted in a day. So um, we'll go ahead and escape out of this, but that kind of gives you a sense of, of an industrialized approach uh, to doing a net zero energy retrofit. Um, so we've been tremendously inspired by what they've done. Um, and we think in order to get retrofits to scale that some degree of standardization industrialization will be needed. The other really cool th thing that they've done is they've really looked holistically at um, what are the other elements that need to be true in order um, to get this to be something that's desirable for owners. Um, so, you know, their um, offering includes high quality in the sense of there's a performance warranty with the, um, with the project. It's non-intrusive, so tenants can stay in place. Um, and as I mentioned, there's kind of a time frame of installation being anywhere from two weeks to um, down to a day, but the idea is to dramatically reduce the amount of time for refurbishment. Um, additionally, they are really working with industry to drive cost compression so that the uh, incremental cost of these improvements is financeable through the energy savings, uh, the deep energy savings that accrue in the project. And then the idea is to create kind of a, a contagion aspect to this where people see that something's happened to the building and efficiency is valued and desired by many others. So um, one of the things that they have done in, in Europe, so like I said, the organization that developed this approach is called Energy Sprong. It was funded by 
uh, a grant um, from the Dutch government, I think it was like $40 million and they floundered around for several years trying to figure out, you know, what are we gonna do about existing buildings? And then finally had this breakthrough. Um, and Energy Sprong basically serves as a market facilitator and they organize all of these major aspects of things that have to work um, in a coordinated fashion for this type of approach to scale in the market. So they organize the demand for these products to send the signal to the supply chain that it needs to organize differently and produce different kinds of products at a certain price point. Um, and then where there were regulatory barriers, they worked at addressing those, as well as um, working with the um, federal and, and local governments to, um, to create incentives to kind of grease the, you know, grease the wheels on getting this thing up and running. And then there's an element to this, which is kind of um, overcoming some of the, you know, the barriers around payback periods and things like that, getting financing that's available at the right price for, and over um, a long enough period of time uh, for the economics on these projects to pencil out. So our goal um, at, at Realize is basically to, um, to take elements of this model inspired by Energy Sprong, to take elements of this model and transfer it to the US um, to really catalyze the retrofit market here, to start to really move in the direction of that three and a half million um, uh, number of retrofits that we need in buildings across the US. So um, I'll talk briefly about kind of some of the, the technologies which, which some of you might be interested in and kind of uh, what the main elements are. So as you saw in that video, there's kind of two major components. There's um, an envelope system that's prefabricated and, and um, has been designed to meet passive house levels of performance and it has windows and doors pre-installed. And then there is an integrated set of mechanical systems, what we call a mechanical pod, that can be quickly installed on site. Um, and, uh, and so those are kind of the two elements we'll talk about. So here is a, a project in the Netherlands um, that you can see before and after. Again, similar kind of um, building type in the sense of it's a it's a masonry structure and they um, enclosed you know all of these um, decks that you know uh, were not necessarily being um, utilized in in maybe an optimal way um, in order to kind of uh, drive better air tightness and reduce thermal bridging in the building this is that same uh, project and you can kind of see some of the details here um, on the top right is a tenant in her kitchen that was remodeled as well. It's an all electric kitchen. Um, all of these projects are all electric. Um, in the bottom right, you'll see kind of those deep set windows. People actually really love um, the deep set windows. And, and you know, these are, are pretty thick wall systems that you saw going in, um, but that was something that was considered uh, desirable. And even though, you know, some folks think the panels need to be thinner, uh, that's mainly for weight reasons, um, but the aesthetics have been appreciated by the tenants. Um, and then on the left, you'll just see some examples of kind of the, the ceiling that's being used in, the, um, in between the panel connections. So everything from caulking to different gaskets. So a lot of the time there'll be a gasket as well as caulking. Um, these are just some of the, you know, kind of different looks that we've seen with this approach. So what's What's nice about this is, um, you know, there are a number of manufacturers that are capable of producing these products and, and uh, you can kind of get a number of different aesthetics, right? So, um, so that you don't lose kind of the, the flavor uh, and authenticity of, of the built environment there and the charm. Um, so we had the opportunity when we went to um, visit one of the uh, wall manufacturers manufacturing facilities um, and uh, this was a really simple product it's it's um, it's an uh, almost like a sit panel and it has um, a fiberglass backing um, this kind of special technique for um, vacuum gluing um, graphite infused um, polystyrene to that fiberglass and then an osb um, uh, board on the top to kind of create that sandwich and then using that 3D scanning that I talked about in the video, they know exactly where the fenestrations are 
for uh, the windows and doors, and they will, um, you know, using their um, BIM to CAD CAM process, they will use a CNC machine to cut out the exact locations of where the existing uh, windows and doors are, and then um, and then install those in the factory, which is great from kind of a, a quality control standpoint where, um, you know, where with passive house, especially there can be windows and doors can be problematic for, for ceiling and uh, water penetration. On the left, you'll see that there are, um, you know, kind of different uh, uh, cladding types that you can order, whether it's stucco or brick, um, to kind of get whatever uh, flavor you're looking for in, in the veneer. Um, one thing to point out is that um, unlike uh, the U.S. construction sector at the moment, uh, where, where this process and way of manufacturing and installing um, retrofits is occurring is with the contractor community. Um, so this is a, a picture from a showroom. We actually weren't allowed to go into. It was top secret. It wasn't, it wasn't open yet. Um, at a company called BAM. They're a large general contractor in the Netherlands and they have decided to become more vertically integrated and are actually um, designing, manufacturing, and constructing these buildings. So think of a de design build contractor, but with manufacturing inserted in, in between design and build. Um, and they're just uh, becoming more vertically integrated. So that was really uh, interesting to see. Um, on the mechanical system side, as I mentioned, uh, these are all electric retrofits. Um, many of the systems were uh, installed either in a kind of distributed uh, fashion or if they were centralized, it would be into one of those um, pods like we discussed. Um, the pod was definitely a preferable way to go in terms of just um, simplicity of, of install. Um, obviously, certain building types are more or less conducive to um, to being able to do a pod, um, but they are generally trying to use that even in kind of the mid-rise multifamily um, building category. Um, uh, so, so in general, that pod includes a heat pump for both space heating and domestic hot water, an ERV, um, uh, the, sorry, that's uh, supposed to be a solar inverter, not the, pa the panels aren't in the pod. Um, and then this kind of printed circuit board, which is um, a control system where they're also able to do um, load shifting and create a, a kind of grid interactive um, set of systems. On the mechanical system side, uh, there was kind of less um, uh, interest by incumbents to make these integrated mechanical pods. Um, and so, uh, actually, some, one of the founders of Energy Sprung has started his own company, um, and, and it, this this part of the the technology offering um, took a little bit more time to get up and running there. So this is just kind of showing you um, the inside, the guts of one of these pods. It's it's kind of like a, a you know Frankenstein um, uh, piece of equipment at the moment. Um, this is kind of you know maybe one of the uh, early iterations of this. Um, it's definitely uh, evolving as we speak. Um, Factory Zero, the company that makes this pod, is uh, doing a joint venture with Denso, who makes a lot of um, uh, HVAC e equipment for the automotive industry. Um, and so they're kind of working on, on the next um, stage of, of what this um, set of system, integrated systems will look like. Um, this is just to show you uh, how you can have the same concept, but for use where it's being installed in an interior space, if there's room for that. Um, for units where there isn't room for that, you can also um, install them on the exterior. So the little um, units that you see kind of um, protruding from the building on the right are exterior installed units, and then the ones on the left are going to be um, installed um, on the balconies of the mid-rise uh, building uh, in the background. So another really important um, component of the energy sprung model was solving the split incentive issue. Um, and what they've created basically, um, similar to that kind of cell phone 
service plan is an energy service plan. So um, they started specifically with the, um, the social housing uh, market segment. Uh, Europe has a lot more social housing, about 25% of the multifamily housing stock in the Netherlands is owned by housing associations. Um, and so previously those units were predominantly um, tenant metered and they went to the Dutch government and asked for permission for the housing associations to also be able to charge an energy service plan fee. And that fee is serves it like rent in that it can be underwritten for debt that can be used to finance a much deeper uh, set of energy improvement measures in major rehab projects. So that service plan equates to an, a budget um, for tenants and kind of like a guaranteed set of services, just like with your cell phone, you get a certain number of minutes and data. Um, and this is an example of a budget from the UK where they, um, they're uh, rolling out this model as well and kind of what the commitments are to the tenant in terms of, you know, um, like amount of hot water at a certain temperature, um, kind of the temperature range for heating and cooling, uh, their plug loads uh, budget, um, and even uh, the amount of noise that the heat pumps, um, you know, can make. So, um, so that uh, basically um, allows for two things to happen. So what, what this model has done is allocated risk to the appropriate party. So on the equipment side, you have the general contractor entering into kind of a, a performance guarantee with the building owner and committing to addressing any sort of system issues or installation issues and maintaining those systems and making sure that they are functioning properly. Um, on the behavioral risk side, you have a contract between the tenant and the owner um, through that energy plan uh, function that is helping uh, to manage that behavioral risk and, and the tenant's consumption. And so um, this structure is something we're, we're currently uh, looking at emulating as well um, here in the US. So without getting into the weeds on this, what I wanted to show is just um, that there's obviously a monitoring component to this that enables for kind of those different structures to function um, between the, the owner and the contractor and the owner and the tenant. And that monitoring um, system is installed in that energy pod that you saw. And, um, and that energy pod manufacturer um, also provides kind of the, um, the user interface for the tenant and the thermostat to basically help them manage their consumption. So the energy pod is collecting monitoring data, it's synthesizing it and presenting it on the various platforms for the, the contractor or solution providers as they call them in the Netherlands, the owner and the tenant to all utilize. Um, one other thing to point out here, um, similar to the comment that I made about vert vertical integration earlier is that you'll notice that solution provider has, um, you know, these equipment providers, right? And those equipment providers are, are producing much more integrated pro products, right? We've got a, a solar provider, but now we've got a roof system provider and this unitized wall, wall panel manufacturer um, and that integrated energy pod. And so the, their value chain is, is starting to transform in a way that um, speaks more to changes in the construction sector in general that we need to see. Um, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of this presentation um, and kind of changing how the construction sector perceives its function um, more to developing products than to you know, building buildings in the field. Um, so this was just a quick example. I won't, these are tiny anyway, but this is just showing you the different monitoring systems, basically that the kind of different parties to those contracts have. On the left, you have the tenants um, you know, screen that's showing them the temperature that they're settings, what temperature, you know, exists in the room. Uh, on the, in that top um, little screen, you can see a green smiley face. You know, they've only consumed about 14% of their, um, their energy budget for that month. 
Um, on the bottom screen, you can see how much solar generation is occurring. Um, and then also kind of a little bit of um, subdividing their consumption, like they're doing a great job with their plug loads, but maybe they've been kind of overcooling or overheating and using a lot of hot water. So it can help them figure out how to manage their consumption. So over here on this side of the, the pond, um, we've been really fortunate to, um, to receive a, a couple of major awards that got, kind of got this whole thing really up and running for us. Um, one of them was a Department of Energy award um, to basically do an energy strong style retrofit on um, a multifamily building in uh, a cold, uh, uh, very cold or mixed humidity climate. Um, and so um, we have selected the Eva White um, apartments in, in Boston. We did a whole typology study of, um, of the most prominent multifamily building typologies in the Northeast and the Midwest and identified buildings that are very similar to the one that you see on this screen as being a very common building type. You'll see them all over, you know, Brooklyn and Queens. There are thousands of them like this. Um, so uh, here's a little bit of information just about kind of the, the current conditions of the building. It's uh, got a terrible EUI, 166, KBTU um, per square foot per year. Um, you know, it has no wall insulation, three inches of uh, roof insulation, um, very old uh, uh, boilers and, um, you know, radiators in the apartments and, and, and hallways. It has, uh, it's, it's got major ventilation problems. There are a lot of complaints about the ventilation. Um, and it's basically uh, dumping air in, uh, in an air handling unit is dumping air into the hallways that's getting sucked up under people's doors and then exhausted out of their kitchen and bathroom. Um, so there's just a lot of obviously opportunity to do something really um, big with this building. Um, so kind of two of the highlights and talking again about those two main components to the solution. We've been working with a um, a startup uh, unitized wall panel manufacturer, high, high performance wall pan panel manufacturer out of Canada. We could not find one in the US that was um, appropriate for a mid-rise um, building type um, and that, uh, that was willing to basically work with us on developing this kind of product for a retrofit. Um, so we, we chose uh, Nexi, who was very excited about this opportunity. And we're hoping to demonstrate their, um, their wall system uh, on the Ebba White building. Um, and then the other aspect of the project is this is sort of a hybrid. So, um, you know, a pure, you know, mechanical pod for each unit just was not possible. There isn't enough space in the units um, to accommodate a pod. So, uh, and so, so what we're planning on doing is a is kind of a hybrid. Like I said, we're going to have a centralized um, BRF, and then we're going to have um, an indoor mini pod that has um, uh, a fan coil, um, you know, to integrate with that BRF system, as well as controls and instrumentation for monitoring, um, along with um, an ERV in each unit to really kind of address the ventilation issues. So this is just kind of showing um, uh, our, our preliminary uh, results on how this um, package will perform. Um, you can see the baseline uh, energy consumption of the building. You know, the owner was planning on doing some improvements, but it was gonna really generate about 15% energy savings. Um, what we're proposing is driving savings to almost 80% um, relative to the baseline. Um, as you can see, this is a very uh, thermal load dominated climate zone. So uh, those of you obviously calling in from California, you're like, why are we looking at this? This isn't anything like our, our situation, but, um, but it's, it's to contrast that there's a lot of juice to be squeezed, obviously, in, in different climate zones. Um, Lastly, I'll just speak to the fact that, um, you know, 
there's an electrification component to our work and something that was really important for us to understand was um, you know, what are the GHG benefits um, of doing this uh, over time? Even if you didn't electrify, um, you can see that uh, there's pretty substantial benefits to just improving the envelope of this building, which you can see here um, with these bars that I'm circling with my cursor. Um, and then we tried to kind of project out based on, on the grid mix um, in Massachusetts, what would be the benefits in uh, 2035. And then when you do electrify, you really obviously glean those, those benefits as the grid um, greens over time. Um, one thing to uh, highlight is there is a real challenge. You saw this massive amount of energy savings, almost 80% energy savings. You're not necessarily seeing the equivalent on the utility cost saving side. And I'm sure we're all um, aware, maybe, maybe some of us are, uh, that there is a massive discrepancy in the price of, of natural gas relative to the price of electricity. Um, in Massachusetts, natural gas is relatively cheap in the Boston market. Electricity is um, per, you know, per kilowatt hour, when you convert therms to kilowatt hours, uh, is four times more expensive. So when you electrify this building, even though it's, you know, it's these heat pumps have a coefficient of performance of, of, of three or more, you're really, um, you're really getting hammered with that four time um, cost premium for electricity. So um, the other exciting work that we're doing is here in California. And um, in California, we've been fortunate enough to win a California Energy uh, Commission EPIC award to basically do market facilitation to, to think holistically about this entire concept and scaling it um, in the state of, of California. And um, part of the project is doing demonstration projects, you know, to really figure out like, what are these um, most, what are the most common building types of multi, we're focused on multifamily at the moment. What are the most common multifamily typologies? And then what are the um, retrofit packages that can be standardized and applied over and over again to thousands of similar buildings? So that's half of our research is defining those typologies, de defining those packages and demonstrating them and showing how these, these pieces um, work together and really starting to even find the manufacturers that can do this for the market. And then the other half is aggregating large volumes of demand to present to manufacturers to help buy down the price of these technologies to make them become more cost effective and therefore scale more rapidly over time. So, um, so that's what we're doing here in California. We've kind of just started on that. And this is one of our, our first selected demonstration sites. It's called Veracruz. It's in Rich Grove, California, which is probably halfway in between Fresno and Bakersfield. Um, and uh, the, the building um, not, has some issues, um, but relative to that building in, um, uh, in Massachusetts, it's EUI is 31. Um, and so it's, it's got, um, you know, better wall insulation um, and some roof insulation, but, uh, but we're really going to have to, <clears throat> and this building was selected because it was representative of many other buildings just like it in, in California. So we're going to have to look at how the, um, the retrofit packages really vary here. And if we are going to do something to the envelope, um, you know, the cost compression is going to have to be pretty substantial because the energy savings just cannot um, support uh, a really expensive system like maybe they could in a market where there's a lot more uh, juice to squeeze from an efficiency standpoint. Um, one thing I will say is that uh, while there are massive efforts to, you know, to totally electrify buildings just don't even worry about the envelope. California has such a mild climate zone. We can just throw heat pumps in. Don't worry about um, insulating. When we, when we look at that in combination with electrifying vehicles, um, we, uh, we are talking about having massive impacts on the grid. And so I think that there's still, um, there's still a role for the envelope performance um, of the building to play in California, even if, um, 
even if it, it, it doesn't have as extreme of a climate as our, as our um, counterparts in the Northeast. So to close, um, I'll just kind of talk about where we're at in the Realize program. We were very fortunate to um, win uh, an award from the US Department of Energy to create a national collaborative for advanced building construction. Um, and DOE uh, really wants to see um, this take root in the construction sector. And so the focus of the collaborative is on um, creating a, a culture where high performance is baked into construction. And there's kind of, you know, a trend emerging globally where um, modular and offsite construction is becoming more and more commonplace, especially as it becomes much more expensive uh, to do construction in these major metropolitan areas. Um, and some of that, um, you know, uh, project work is actually being shipped overseas. These modular um, units are being constructed in Poland or China. Um, and so the construction sector is one of the largest, if not the largest sector in the US economy. And the fact that that can be exported through, um, you know, the transformation of the construction sector to, to being uh, more of a manufacturing based industry is a pretty big um, you know, threat to that, that sector in the US. So that's a big focus for the US government. And we're hoping that by engaging through that, that channel that we can really um, bake in high performance elements to construction in a way where this becomes the mainstream. So to be clear, our strategy is focusing on the construction sector more so than on the utility sector, which is kind of where efficiency um, programs obviously have, have originated. But we're recognizing if we want to hit the scale that we were talking about previously, we, we have got to um, infiltrate the construction sector. This needs to become business as usual. So that's um, the goal of, of the ABC. And that will kind of um, sit over a lot of these efforts that we've talked about. Um, there's a lot of R&D being done right now on mechanical pods and panel development. Those products just don't exist for our market. Um, we need to demonstrate those technologies in a way that help um, building owners adopt them more rapidly and understand what's being asked of them and how this benefits them. Um, and then there's a big piece of this, which I spoke of, which is engaging large portfolio owners so that we can aggregate demand, present that to manufacturers and buy down, you know, have group procurement bring down the price for these measures that therefore accelerates um, their scaling in the market. So that's it from me. Um, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And I think we have Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, one of the things that really struck me is while there's a lot of technical questions, how does this work in the US? How does, is it possible for single family homes and so forth? I remember when I was studying um, building sciences, one of the big questions was about building turnover. At what point is it cheaper to just pull it over, knock it down, build a brand new thing? Um, so I don't know the exact number, right? The price per square foot varies in different markets, but I, I agree with that statement. It's like, if, you know, it doesn't make any sense to retrofit a building and it, let's say it costs, um, you know, $400 per square foot for new construction. And if your retrofit costs are $500 per square foot, then you should tear the quote unquote, tear the building down um, and, and start from scratch. Now, obviously there are certain historic buildings and things like that, that, you know, have, have cultural and sentimental value that we don't want to tear down. This approach is not being recommended for those, right? Like this is, this is for track homes. This is for, you know, very um, generic building types that, you know, that we don't necessarily have an emotional attachment to what they look like right now, where they would like for them to have a facelift. Mm -hmm. um, and where, to this person's point, you know, where the cost for a retrofit is 
lower or ideally substantially lower than new construction. And, and when we were talking before about that issue of scaling up, I know from my perspective in the renewable space, we've seen this great evolution. Um, like five, seven years ago, when I first joined Solar, you'd go to events, there'd be developers wandering around dying to find an investor for their project. And now it's flipped to the degree that it's cheaper to install brand new solar than to keep 74% of all uh, coal electricity running. And so it's flipped to the point that at these events, you now have people with buckets of money wandering around looking for projects. So that issue of scaling seems like a very critical one. And we're seeing on a residential level, California addressing some things like uh, solar through mandates and writing it into building code or writing it into uh, things like Title 24. What approaches have you guys been thinking about in terms of the policy side of, of it? Um, well, on the policy side, I would say we haven't been, we haven't really done a lot of work on the policy side. I would say, you know, COVID could potentially present an opportunity for, you know, stimulus that maybe could help, um, you know, kind of grease the wheels, like I said, on, on some of this work. And, and we have been starting to think about that, obviously. Um, but I would say that to your point on solar, we're, we're really hoping to develop something similar to Sunshot, right? Which, and we would do this by each of these technologies where we set uh, kind of a cost target where, you know, along a volumetric cost curve where we say, you know, this, these are the prices that we need to see this thing go down. You know, we need to see this go down at these basic levels of, of demand. Um, and that's a body, a whole body of work that we'll be doing through the ABC collaborative um, to define what kind of what those sunshot goals are for each of the critical technologies for, um, you know, for these high performance uh, building systems. Great. Fantastic. And before we start pulling some of the questions in from the audience, we also wanted to plant the question with the audience about trying to really kind of source from people who are working in the industry or working in different corners, any ideas about how you would scale up, how you would see getting to that critical mass. And so think about that. Put your hand up in the chat if you would like to weigh in on that. But meanwhile, I'm going to hand over to a couple of people for questions. So first up, um, Jack, would you like to um, give us a, a quick question of you had some interesting questions about the how this all works together? Well, I think you kind of answered it, but I think I was just thinking how attached people are to the facades of their houses. And um, somebody else said made the same point about bay windows and all the kind of features that houses have in the United States. And then you sort of answered it by talking about track homes and generic buildings. I, I'm just wondering what percentage of the buildings you think this would really appeal to people for? I, I think I'm worried that it might not be a lot. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, with with the bay the bay window thing um the idea is that you take a, a 3d scan of a building and you take its existing geometry and you manufacture the wall panel to to fit the exact geometry and keep the windows in the same place and so, so some of the some of the benefits of this approach are you don't necessarily have to change the aesthetics unless you want to if you want to create a building that has a similar aesthetic to what's already there, you can. Um, there's a project actually happening in, um, in Brooklyn by, you all might've heard of her, an architect named Chris Benedict. And she wants to do this crazy um, laser cutting of EFIS, okay? Some people hate EFIS, but she's actually turned it into an art form. And there, this building um, in, Brooklyn is the community is very attached to and it has a very specific um, kind of mosaic look of of the of the masonry of, of the facade and she's going to scan it and get that same exact aesthetic basically laser cut into EFIS so that it maintains um, maintains that look so I think 
I think we're kind of scratching, you know, these, these wall systems I showed you are kind of like, you know, version, you know, the beta version, like the, the, we're, we're just starting to, to look at what this, what this, how this could be done, right? What about 3D printing? Like, is there a way to use 3D printing to, um, to address some of the facade issues? Um, there's also obviously a need for addressing some of these issues, maybe from the interior. Um, sometimes interior retrofits can be uh, more challenging just, just because of, of not wanting to trap moisture and things like that. Um, but, but to me, this is, that's where we need industry to step in and where a big role of the collaborative and, um, and the DOE, you know, at this point and, and the CEC and, and NYSERDA, NYSERDA has their own energy sprung program um, called Retrofit New York will be to fund the R&D of these types of systems, right? To help enable the market to continue to innovate um, to solve some of these problems. But I think in the interim, you know, as we kind of ramp up, I think there are, there are plenty of very basic vanilla buildings that, you know, that would, that this would work on to scale up the market as we get more sophisticated. Great. And just um, bundling a couple of people's questions together. First of all, my question, you were talking about ethos or something, if you could explain a little about that. Yeah. And then Rebecca was asking about whether it's possible to do this without polystyrene. And Becky was asking about adding solar, whether that's something that happens to everything or if that can be done to drive the electric costs down. Yeah, so um, the first question on EFIS, it stands for Exterior Insulation Finishing System. Um, and it's basically styrofoam. Right. And um, it, it, it was very controversial. It's, it's, it's the, it's the um, product that goes with a lot of stucco systems. Um, and it, there were a lot of problems with it when stucco first came out and, you know, this, this stuff was holding water like a sponge and rotting out the OSB and behind the stucco. Um, and so it kind of, it kind of got a bad name. Um, it obviously is a problem from an embodied carbon standpoint. Like we, we've got to get the foam out of these wall systems. Mm. Um, and so embodied carbon is a part of our work as well. It's just like, we're already kind of like at the bleeding edge and um, there's, you know, we've got to, we, we know that we've got to get the foam out, but we, we also don't have all of the, all of the materials that are, are affordable, right? Like we could use rock wool um, that has, I think, a better um, global warming potential relative to EFIS. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the, what the difference is, but there are products out there, but they're either like really, really expensive or they're really heavy. So part of the issue is like, if you're hanging this on a, stick frame building um, and you don't want to basically cut a ditch and and build a new footing to put this panel on which would just cost a fortune you've got to have really lightweight materials so those are some of the design constraints we're trying to work through um, but there there are obviously um, you know plus things being fire resistant right so maybe we could use cellulose but we've got to make sure we're meeting fire code so so those are all, or, you know, in California, we've got termites, right? So we've got to watch out for the bugs. So like, there's all these things that we have to um, obviously balance, but it is very much at the core and the spirit of where we want to get. And we're just not, we're just not there yet, but that is critical to, to the long-term solution that we want to develop. And, and the question about solar, is that something that's going into all of these and does oh, it sorry. actually drive the cost down or is that yes. more about energy independence? So it, uh, solar definitely drives the cost down depending on what market you're in. Um, California has obviously very um, rich, you know, rich net energy metering policies compared to other markets. Um, and so in California right now, you can almost just electrify and throw on some solar and you've got you've got it major at zero um the um there was something else i was going to say about that um oh well there's buildings obviously that don't have enough roof space to offset their their load with um 
generation. So we we did look into community solar. Community solar is still kind of expensive, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know a lot of a lot of what's happening to the um, to the California grid will uh, will help with that. So that's why we're saying net zero carbon. We don't really want to get too hung up on definitionally on like is it you know are we going with on-site generation or off-site generation we kind of want to look at and people also argue with setting eui targets but in some ways it's like getting that eu target eui target right and then how you generate can can vary depending on the needs of of the site because we what we what we didn't want to do was because there, there's a few ways that you can define your your load, right? You can define it based on like my, my, I can put this size solar system on my roof and I can generate this much energy. So therefore my load can be X. And that means that you're going to have a ton of variation, right? In terms of the retrofit packages, because some buildings can generate much more power than others, depending on their, um, their solar um, uh, massing. But um, if we're trying to get standardization of packages and to be able to use packages over and over again, then we needed to define it by something different. So EUI is kind of where, where we're starting. And that's the energy usage use intensity. Yep. Energy intensity, use intensity, right. it's, a, it's a metric of the kil, um, uh, BTUs, thousand BTUs mm -hmm. used um, per year on a square foot, uh, per, uh, uh, floor area square foot. Um, there, there's a question from Alison. She doesn't have her mic today, but she was asking something that ties into what you were talking about, um, which is, first of all, kind of identifying the scale of these, but also how does this then translate into, say, maybe commercial or industrial building stock? Yes. Okay. So scale, um, that is a body of work that... Um, we just we know we need to get done and we are really grateful that we just won this doe award because there's a whole scope of work in there to like look across the us the different markets and figure out like what is the actual market size for this and manufacturers want to know um you know everybody wants to know so i don't have um a number for the whole us yet and um there are different ways you could slice it. We do have a, a mechanical, I think it's a mechanical insight brief on our Realize webpage that does have a, we did a market study, a market sizing study for the Northeast and Midwest um, for those mechanical pods. So you can take a look at that. Um, and uh, with regards to how can some of these technologies be applied to other market segments, um, some of these, you know, buildings that we're looking at, multifamily buildings that we're looking at here in California, I mean, they're, all, they're practically like single family, right? So our, a lot of our solutions that we're developing for that low rise stick frame construction building type in California can be applied to single family. And that's our hope. Um, the wall systems, like especially the mid rise wall system that we're looking at for the Boston pilot, we think that can be used on commercial buildings, um, mid rise um, commercial buildings. We're not really getting into the high rise uh, market yet. I think we're just trying to bite off, you know, these two <laughs> categories first. Um, but uh, but I, I see a lot of potential for that. On the industrial side, um, in, industrial facilities, um, you know, it very much varies by what type of industry is happening there. But a lot of the time they're dominated by um, thermal load, like industrial thermal loads. Mm -hmm. um, and they have uh, some, some industries, if you develop a solution for one manufacturer, you, you can, you've solved it for the rest of them. Um, for others, they have very unique industrial processes and systems so that every single, you know, manufacturer is a snowflake when you're developing a solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so we haven't really started to venture through this program into that space. Um, mm -hmm our pathways to zero program uh, is looking more at that. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's what I can say on that front. Great. So I'm going to take one last question from Jay Caldwell and then let's throw it open to a quick discussion and brainstorm about scaling because that sounds like the 
biggest uh, hurdle you're facing at the moment. So Jay, fire away. Oh, did we lose? Okay, am I muted? No, nope, you're, you're good, fire away. Okay, well, I just, I've been working on, uh, you know, in this field for a long time at a very uh, thousand foot level, but uh, I remember that the Rocky Mountain Institute had done and developed buildings that they could do solar energy and, and produce enough energy to um, make it less expensive than any other kind of energy. And, and it was uh, cheaper to build and cheaper to operate. And yet here we are still almost at ground zero. And I'm just wondering um, what is the, what's the major barrier keep us, keeping us from moving forward? Um, so I, I agree with you that there are operational savings. There are, um, there are some instances where business as usual construction and, um, high efficiency construction are the same, are the same price. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, you know, there, there are a number of factors, but I, for me, the one that I, I focus on the most in this work is that we've been fixated on the utility sector. We keep trying to get the change to happen through the utility sector and, and, and they're the wrong, they're the wrong actor to be, I think, pushing. They, they, they're not construction companies and what needs to happen to buildings is driven by contractors. Right. And so that's why I, I feel passionately about like, um, trying to catalyze a transformation in the construction sector. And if we have to use industrial construction to get their attention to change, then that's the lever that we are gonna use. Um, because if an owner can buy something that performs better, looks better, uh, is higher quality and cheaper, right. <laughs> by using offsite construction, they're not gonna use the traditional builders that keep kind of producing the same stuff. Now it's obviously a very litigious sector. Um, you know, we had a conversation with Jigger Sean, he's like the construction sector in the United States is designed to be bankruptable. And so there are these kind of um, systemic issues that, that we're, you know, up against that are gonna require some, some real thought and kind of reconfiguration of, of the players and how these systems work. Um, and that's what we're hoping to have the space to think of through, through the national collaborative because it's going to require a transformation of the construction sector because the utility sector, we've been doing it for 40 years with them. It's not changing. It's not enough. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting coming from the solar side where you see a lot of utilities as really their roadblocks because, hey, invest in something that will put you out of business. No, thank you. So I think that's really interesting turning away from utilities. Um, I'd love to open it up for other folks to just jump in in the last couple of minutes. I think you're able to unmute yourself with ideas, but I wanted to start throwing out a couple of uh, ideas for how to scale up. So if we take the renewable energy industry, which if you don't watch Michael Moore's movie, you'll see has done a fabulous job of scaling. Mm -hmm. And a couple of ideas from there. One is tax incentives from the federal government. So the ITC was a way, the investment tax credit and the residential solar credits were a way to basically get over that hump of affordability when it wasn't affordable. So homeowners this year who go solar get 26% back in terms of tax credits. So that was one financing tool we saw. Another one is PACE, which is property assessed clean energy. And so that's not expecting the homeowner to afford it. It's basically wrapping it into the tax, tax bill and putting it with something that is not dependent on the homeowner's um, score. And that's also when the homeowner is not the resident is, is an interesting idea. Um, one other idea, and I'd love to, if anyone in, is listening is um, more, knowledge, more knowledgeable about how to start things like this, but it also strikes me, you can't do this with robots. 
I mean, you might be able to do some of the panelized work, but a lot of energy efficiency jobs are really manual and we're facing record unemployment about to hit, or at least record in our lifetimes. So that's another thought is how do we really take the energy efficiency piece and marry it with jobs? And would love to hear from anyone else who has ideas about how to, um, how to get this scaled. Yeah, so um, this is Paul Wormer speaking. Um, I'm, as I'm listening to this, I'm seeing, in a sense, a number of different components. And so when we talk about scaling it, I'm not sure the same solution strategy applies for all areas. So for example, I think the idea of a mechanical pod that comes in with a nice heat pump based uh, DHW space heating solution is something that's broadly applicable. Uh, and if you think of coupling it to a energy strong type retrofit, you restrict the market for that dramatically. And so you lose an opportunity for scale. Um, I also think picking up on what Deborah was saying about the labor intensity, recognizing I think that we have three or four segments of the market where this is these 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 think these things become significant. Uh, one is what I will call is the 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 mid-century commodity design market. Uh, these are the subdivisions that you run into everywhere. Uh, they're on fairly large lots. If you stick stuff on the outside, it's still relatively easy to replicate the building. The energy, uh, the, the, the building exterior features, and you get these nice deep windows, which really are wonderful things. Uh, and that's one segment, and that's low rise, that's mid rise, and I don't know how well this works on high rise or how high up it goes, but but that's one really segment. Um, you've got the, what I will call for, for, for with, 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 with strict regional bias, uh, the San Francisco house. Uh, these are old buildings with significant historic character. These solutions probably are never going to apply there because they will just do so much damage to the property value and the neighborhood character. Those areas where we need to think about uh, the customized solutions. And even there, it's possible subsets of what is being looked at. For example, uh, the laser measurement technology to design and replace existing windows with compatible, I will say wood frame windows, but cut to fit, uh, high volume manufacturing using automation. Um, is, is, is an opportunity to get some of this machining and measuring technology spread out uh, with folks in the high end who are willing to pay for that. Hmm. And what you're really looking at is the technology. How do we measure the building exterior? How do we cut and machine the parts? And so when you talk about things like windows and doors and existing buildings, but upgrading them to uh, higher insulation values, that's an opportunity to, to get the high end of the market interested in it, in, in retrofits. Um, and then you've got new construction. And I think in the new construction, an area that's really uh, a lot of opportunities is the low income housing. That's a big deal in California. And there you get into developing the offsite panel construction um, so that once there is a framework that's up, those panels can go directly on the exterior frame, dramatically reducing cost, time to money and so on. So I think if you partition this, the scaling solutions in different areas, you might get the broader uptake more quickly. Thank you. 
Yeah, and that's interesting, the whole concept of mass customization. Um, I know we're five, six minutes past the hour. Just wanted to check in, um, Martha, if you're good for another couple of minutes or? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, the, uh, anyone else with ideas on scaling mechanisms, whether it's policy, financial, uh, we've, we've got people in the chat talking about Green New Deal, would just take yourself off mute and jump on in. Yes, uh, I'd like to make a few comments. First of all, this is Gary Sherlock here. Uh, Martha, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I found it extremely interesting. Um, a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned we, you uh, discussed primarily technology, and I think a, a big factor hurdle to get over, and it was lightly brought up, was the aesthetic and the design and the aesthetic point of view of it as a selling point, and of course uh, the cost and economics. But taking it past that, uh, one of the things that we see from our practice is that if you're going to take it in the arena of the developer and that developer has to meet a certain percentage of low-income housing or what have you, then you fall into uh, the um, design review process. And that design review process, depending upon whether it's city or county, uh, is a really uh, moving door. The people that are involved in that design review process, it can be up to the whim of the design review board whether they want to move it forward because they believe in the idea or not, or they feel that idea is appropriate. And so it it's a, a, can be a very, very big hurdle. And so often one or two people can uh, kind of put a, a, a stop to it just because they don't believe in it. Hence, kind of what we all battle here, of you know, global warming, uh, being green, and there's always a few people out there who that were constantly battling. And so how do you see this uh, coming into play uh, in a, you're dealing with that larger scale versus the small residential? Um. Yeah, so thank you for raising that point. It's definitely something we're aware of and um, it's actually uh, something that is preventing the, the full cost reduction that modular and offsite construction can offer because, for example, a lot of um, modular construction companies, anytime they go to a, a new municipality or, or jurisdiction where they're implementing a project, they have to um, send these standardized designs back to their design team to rework so that it complies with local um, local code um, for you know for permitting purposes. So it, it adds this extra cost. So it's um it's a body of work that um, I think the Modular Building Institute is looking into. Um, but we also uh, want to get a handle on if you can almost um, have like state level. Um, uh, approvals that kind of can supersede some of this stuff. Um, and so there's a big part of what the National Collaborative is going to do is convene um, the different market actors that are required to make this thing fly. Um, and one of those will be states and municipalities that, that care very much about seeing this take root in their in their markets. Um, so the idea is to work with them on like we're working very closely with the city of Boston, working on the Ever White project to figure out like how do how do they need to work with their building department to make sure that these are, you know, like stamped like very quickly that there's almost like, um, you know, you get moved to the top of the permitting line if you're doing something like this. Um, so those are some of the um, the ways that we're hoping to engage those types of actors to remove some of those barriers. Is the uh, modular design uh built from a kit of parts? In other words, can the outside aesthetic value of it uh, change yes. very easily? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to add a comment, if I may, uh, based on experience. I've been an uh, engineering contractor for about 20 years now. And, uh, and, and again and again, I see, I, I, I see the, uh, one of the major factors that sort of prevent us from scalability. Uh, in my mind, primarily is just a mindset that we all have. Say for instance, if we think about why small businesses such as mine can prosper, you know, with all this knowledge that I already have, 
and, and it's all come down to, you know, how the corporate, you know, like everything else, we need to start a, 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 a grass, uh, a grass root movement where, where we could train and, and keep more transparency to small business uh, uh, and educate people uh, uh, in order to, to uh, prevail themselves uh, economically and also to sort of uh, uh, give a, a bigger force, you know, for, for the bigger enterprise not to kind of hinder that effort. Mm -hmm. So really it's just a, it, it's, it's just a, in my, again and again, it's just like, it, it's, it's difficult because it go in the whole room of, 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 of the uh, political, economic and, 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 and social uh, 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 mindset that we need to sort of uh, reframe ourselves with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think we're pretty much on the top of the hour there, or well after the hour, there were plenty of, of other questions. I think one of the things that I was hearing from, question, from people was this kind of multi-pronged approach. So there's a lot of people in the uh, policy action group within Climate Realities uh, Bay Area chapter who could probably talk about how to get one city at a time. And you saw that with solar, whereas first city started and they required it in new buildings. I'm also hearing people talking about, let's get the people who want to spend a lot of money kind of help scale it, which is what you saw with solar in the early days where people who went solar were doing it out of conviction, not out of economics. And then the other thing that I'm hearing as a, as a really um, kind of being raised a lot is the concept of getting to scaling by um, having, and you see this also in solar, you have the utility scale, you have the mass commercialization that might be new construction commercial buildings and have that subsidize the ability to do um, more um, mass customization. Mm -hmm. So it's really been a really interesting discussion. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank evening. You. Thank you for everyone who was online and sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We'll have this um, recording on our YouTube uh, station sometime this weekend and look forward to uh, to talking to everyone and uh, getting some additional feedback on this. Thank you for your time, Martha. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining on a Wednesday night. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye,